It's weekend and we're back with Company Nama to give you all of this week's inside out updates from the corporate and startup world. I'm Shreshtha Tiwari. Over to the corporate world updates first. Reliance Industries Limited shareholders and its secured and unsecured creditors have approved the demerger of the company's financial services business, which is Reliance Strategic Ventures. The financial services arm will now be renamed to Geo Financial Services Limited. Almost 100% of the votes were in favour of the demerger. Billionaire Mukesh Amani led company said this on a release on May 3rd. Shareholders of Reliance Industries will receive one share of Geo Financial Services for every share held by by them in the parent company. KV Kamath will be the non-executive chairman of the demerged ent entity whose shares will be listed on both BSC and NSC. It was back in October 2022 when RIL had approved the demerger of the financial services arm. Auto parts maker Minda Corporation on May 2nd sought the Competition Commission of India's approval to buy 24.5% stake in a rival Precol. According to a regulatory filing, Minda had in February bought a 15.7% stake in Precol for 400 crore rupees in a surprise move that triggered a confrontation with the promoter group of the target company led by managing director Vikram Mohan. In its February report, rating agency Crystal had said that it does not anticipate any major impact on account of Minda's minority stake acquisition in Precol in the near term as the management control and majority shareholding of Precol continue to remain with the existing promoters. On February 17, Minda had acquired 1.91 crore shares shares or 15.7% of the equity in Coimbatore-based auto component manufacturer for 400 crore rupees. As of March 2023, the promoter and promoter group held 36.53% of the holding on Precol, while public shareholding stood at 63.47%. Reliance Industries, Adani Power, Torrent Power, Vedanta and Jindal Power are among 14 companies that have shown interest in acquiring Gujarat-based Bhadreshwar Vidyut, which is undergoing insolvency. This is the third bankrupt power producer for which two of the country's largest corporate houses, Reliance Industries and the Adani Group, have shown interest. They had earlier offered resolution plans for SKS Power and Lanko Amarkantak Power, but both conglomerates did not aggressively pursue the bids. Resolutions of both SKS Power and Lanko Amarkantak are yet to be concluded. Both Reliance and the Adani Group had also submitted expressions of interest for future retail, which was admitted for insolvency last year. Bharti Enterprises and Brookfield Asset Management entered into a 5,000 5, crore rupees joint venture agreement for a 3.3 million square feet portfolio of commercial properties in Delhi NCR region and Punjab. With this agreement, a Brookfield controlled real estate fund will now have an ownership of 51% of the joint venture, while Bharti Enterprises will retain a 49% stake. Spread over 3.3 million square feet, the properties include Worldmark Aero City in Delhi, Airtel Centre and Worldmark 65 in Gurugram and also the Pavilion Mall in Punjab's Ludhiana City. After this deal, the company will retain ownership and operation of its remaining commercial properties which include a 10 million square foot development in Delhi Aero City. Market regulator SEBI has requested an additional six months from the Supreme Court to complete the ongoing investigation into the Adani case. On April 29, SEBI filed an application with the Supreme Court seeking to extend the investigation period. In March, the Supreme Court directed SEBI to complete the investigation into the Adani case within two months and submit the investigation report to the Supreme Court. Adani Group has also responded to SEBI's request to extend the investigation period. The Adani Group said that SEBI's application for an extension of the investigation period did not provide any information about the group's wrongdoing. In addition, a report claims that the Adani case investigation is progressing slowly and SEBI will face challenges in gathering information from several foreign regulators, especially some FPIs, regarding ultimate beneficial ownership. 
Tata Sons is in talks to raise a loan of 10,000 crore rupees with lenders of or creditors of Tata Capital. This amount will be used in lending business. Recently, the board of Tata Capital Financial Services had approved its merger with Tata Clean Tech Capital. The funds raised in this quarter will help increase the balance sheet of the merged company. Tata Capital is becoming quite aggressive in the retail loan segment and most of the funds raised will be used in home and personal loans. Financial services are of significant importance for Tata Sons and therefore Tata Sons plans to provide adequate funds to TCL through Tata Capital. Talking about corporates, let's take a look at those companies that were on the radar this week. Jet Airways is back in news as the Central Bureau of Investigation on Friday conducted searches at seven locations in Mumbai linked to the promoters of Jet Airways, Naresh Goel, in connection with an alleged 538 crore rupees bank fraud case. Goel's wife Anita and others are accused in the case. The CBI searches were conducted at private residences and offices of Goel, his wife and former airline director Gaurang Ananda Shetty. A new case of alleged bank fraud of 538 crore rupees has been filed based on a complaint from Canara Bank. The bank has accused Jet Airways of diversion of funds among other irregularities. The CBI officers have said on April 17, 2019, cash-strapped Jet Airways announced that it was temporarily shutting down its operations in India after it failed to secure emergency funding from any source including lenders. Talking about cash traps, go first, the airlines that remain constantly on the radar this week. The Vadia Group, which owns go first airlines, could seek a waiver from the insolvency and bankruptcy court rules that bars promoters from bidding for their own companies because the cash trap carrier's account with banks is still marked as standard. Defaulters are prevented from submitting a resolution plan for an insolvent company. The Vadia Group, which owns Go First, is likely to push for a one-time settlement with banks under which creditors will take a substantial haircut. The Vadia Group has not defaulted on a payment to creditors till date and hence will not be barred from offering a resolution plan. Experts say that in a way, Go First has shown the way for financially struggling firms on how to protect itself and work on coming back to life. Meanwhile, Lessers on Thursday urged DGCA to deregister 23 Go First aircrafts to secure their assets before the insolvency process begins. A moratorium order by the NCLT prohibits institution and continuation of suits and recovery of assets by owners and lessers. GoFirst has blamed engine manufacturer Pratt & Whitney for its woes and said that recurring def defects and non-availability of spare engines resulted in prolonged grounding of its aircraft and loss of revenue. The Enforcement Directorate on Thursday said it, that it has frozen assets worth 143 crore rupees of VP Nandakumar, the MD and CEO of prominent Kerala-based NBFC Mannapuram Finance after it conducted raids as part of a money laundering investigation. Six premises in Trishur, where the company is headquartered, were covered by the ED during the searches. The assets frozen include eight bank accounts, investment in listed shares and shares of Mannapuram Finance. In addition to this, various incriminating documents Evidence, evidencing money laundering and property documents of 60 immovable properties were also seized during the course of search. The ED has claimed that evidence has been recovered regarding money laundering and large-scale cash transactions in the form of public deposits done by Nanda Kumar through his proprietary firm Manapram Agro Farms without the RBI approval. The deposits were illegally collected by him at various branch offices of Manapuram Finance Limited, which is a public listed company, through some of its employees. When RBI detected the same and directed to return the amount to the depositors, the accused have responded to RBI that they have returned the money to the depositors, but ED investigation revealed that there is no proof of repayment or no KYC of the depositors. Further, 53 crore rupees of deposits are shown to have been returned in cash but with no proof of repayment or KYC. In a development that could aid the resolution of Reliance Capital, the National Company Law Tribunal directed Credit Suisse-led bondholders to return the equity shares in Reliance General Insurance to Administrator Nageshwara Rao. In Thursday's episode of Corporate Central, we had told you about Credit Suisse writing to the administrator about their claim for a debt of 660 crore rupees. Credit Suisse wrote to the admin stating that lenders should not proceed in finalizing the resolution until the NCLT decides the matter. 
The tribunal said handing over of the shares would not alter the security interest of the bondholders. Experts also say that this could imply that these bondholders may be entitled to superior treatment over other creditors. A buyback agreement signed 30 years ago is the only deal between the Hiramats and Kalyani Group and the alleged family arrangement of 1994 was merely a note by Baba Kalyani's father, Neelkan Kalyani, replying to the suit by Jaydev Hiramat and Suganda Hiramat, promoters of specialty chemical firm Hikal. The affidavit said that the unsigned family arrangement of 1994 was just a note and that it did not reflect the true understanding pertaining to Hikal shares. Further, the lawsuit by the Hiramats is uh, to prevent Kalyani Group firms from acquiring further shares in Hikal, according to the affidavit filed by industrialist Baba Kalyani. A limited affidavit that was filed as a reply, Baba Kalyani also stated that Hiramats' lawsuit was based on wrong and false claims and it should be dismissed. The Bombay High Court on Wednesday appointed retired Justice S.J. Kathawala as the sole arbitrator in a dispute between Max Healthcare Institute and Care Hospitals and the latter's owner Evercare Group, which belongs to private equity giant TPG, to decide upon all disputes between the parties. The move came after. Max Healthcare cited a breach of a term sheet clauses and a commercial agreement as well as contractual rights. Max Healthcare had given a non-binding offer to TPG. The Max offer valued care hospitals at 3,700 crore rupees, excluding Bangladesh, Bangladesh assets. However, Blackstone is believed to have signed a binding agreement with TPG. The ED conducted searches at three locations related to the world's most valuable edtech startup Baiju's last Saturday, including the startup CEO Baiju Ravindran's residence and office. Baiju's has been accused of violating and the Foreign Exchange Management Act rules in the investment it received from foreign companies. It was di discovered during the ED's raid that Baiju's has received direct foreign investment of 28,000 crore rupees from 2011 to 2023. It has also been reported that ED may gather information about Baiju's transactions and debts from various banks. There are concerns that after the ED's raid, Baiju may face difficulties in raising new funding. In response to the case, Baiju's CEO Ravindran clarified to his employees through an email that Baiju's has received FDI of 28,000 crore rupees, which is the largest foreign investment by any startup in the country so far, and all the money came through banking channels. And that was all about corporate world. Moving on to the big updates from the startup world this week. Misho on Friday announced that it has let go of 251 employees in the fresh round of job cuts. This represents around 15% of its workforce. In April 2022, Misho had fired 150 employees as it restructured its grocery business, Farmizo. In an email dated May 5th, co-founder and CEO Vidit Atre informed the company staff about the decision, citing a challenging macroeconomic environment. This comes at a time when startups are struggling to raise funds and the period has been labelled as funding winter. To be able to survive this winter, many startups have cut jobs to reduce costs. Fintech unicorn Grow has acquired 100% stake in the mutual fund business of India Bulls Housing Finance for 175.62 crore rupees. The deal includes cash and cash in equivalent of 100.62 crore rupees. The closing date for the transaction was recorded as May 3, 2023. The acquisition is limited to India Bulls mutual fund business and the alternative investment fund has been retained by India Bulls Housing Finance. Grow got the approval of Competition Commission of India in September 2021 to acquire India Bulls Asset Management Company and India Bulls Trustee Company. Indian EV ride-hailing platform Blue Smart Mobility has raised $42 million, which is around 342 crore rupees, in a bridge round led by existing investors BP Ventures and Sarvam Partners. The uh, round also saw the participation of uh, BlueSmart's leadership team. The company has raised $37 million in equity and $5 million in venture debt in this round, with nearly 50% of the funding being subscribed by BlueSmart's founders and leadership team. BlueSmart has uh, so far raised a total of $109 million across Seed and Series A2 rounds, including $85 million in equity in Series A. And with that, it's a wrap on Company Nama this week. We'll be back next Saturday. But to get your daily corporate updates, watch Corporate Central, Money Nine's daily dose on corporates and market. Have a safe weekend and don't forget to tune in to Money Nine.